Good morning. Uh, I want to thank everybody for joining us for Sunday morning service. We're going to get into the Word. A lot going on in the world, right? A lot going on in Morgan City or this uh, Tri-City area. Uh, a lot going on in the church. People getting sick and uh, people being exposed to the COVID. So uh, we just want to lift everyone up in prayer and ask the Lord uh, for His healing power that we know He paid a high price for us to have access to. And then also want to pray, you know, that the Lord will continue to give us wisdom and that we would be able to see properly, spiritually, to navigate through these times where we, where we that we're in, that we're located in. I know everybody has differing opinions about a lot of different things, um, but I do believe that uh, whenever we see the, the situation that's going on in the world today, and we if we view this situation through the lens of scripture, um, it seems to me that there's definitely changes that are taking place in the world, obviously. And some people would have differing opinions on how that originated and whatnot. I just know this one thing, that the Lord told us that in the last days, or that Jesus himself said, work while it is day, for the night comes when no man will be able to work. Now, we're not in the night yet. But I'll tell you one thing, whatever's going on in this world is trying to make it very difficult for us to be able to still work under the light of day, spiritually speaking. And so we just want to have wisdom and we want to have understanding as we continue to move forward and we want to preach the gospel. We want to preach the true gospel of Jesus Christ and we want people to be able to have access to that gospel because the, the good news is going to set people free. It's going to set people free spiritually, and it's going to put them in a position to be able to receive grace. And listen, grace is more important now than it ever was before. And I'm talking about grace not just for forgiveness of sin. Thank you, Lord, for forgiveness of sin. But grace to empower believers to stand strong in the face of evil. To stand strong in, against opposition, against the principalities, powers, world rulers, and spiritual wickedness in heavenly places. For you war not after flesh and blood, but against spiritual entities that are trying to destroy the plan and the works of God. I believe that with all of my heart. That is, uh, that is, that is, the, that is the word of God. Amen? So let's just pray for everyone right now that, and, and, and the illnesses and everything that's going on. Father, in the name of Jesus, we just thank you for sending your precious son to die in our place. And we understand what the cross has done in many ways and probably in many ways we don't need, we'll, we'll never completely understand it, but we do know that the cross of Jesus allowed, gave an opportunity for him to die for our sin, to take our guilt away, for us to be clothed in his righteousness. Now clothed in his righteousness, we have access to grace, we have access into your presence boldly entering the throne room of grace through the veil which is his flesh his flesh was torn for us just as the veil of the temple was torn on the day that he died spiritually speaking when we put faith in Christ the veil was torn for us as individuals and we can now enter into the holy of holies into the very presence of God and where the presence of the Lord is there is liberty and there is freedom the heavens are not brass to us Lord because of what you have done for us on the cross and so we come to you, Father, in the name of your precious Son, Jesus, and we're asking for your healing power to touch those that are sick right now. Lord God, right now, I, I, I come against the inflammation in their bodies, of the, the infection, whatever it is that people are being ailed with right now, we thank you for a complete healing. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. So look, last Sunday, whenever I taught, we kind of entered into the book of Romans. Let's go ahead and start reading in Romans. We're going to read, start off with reading Romans chapter 5, and we're going to read verses 19 through 21. It says, For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound, but where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. That as sin has reigned unto death, even so might grace reign unto righteousness, unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. I'm going to just go ahead and set the screen where we can kind of see everything there. And I just want you to notice 
where it says, Sin has reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life. This provides a good little short synoptic review for last week where I preached on uh, two kings, two kingdoms. The idea was is that spiritually speaking in the New Testament, specifically in this Romans passage, and really we preached verses 15 and 17, but it had some of the same terminology. As a matter of fact, the word reign was repeatedly used. The word reign describes kings and kingdoms. It's the reign of a king. And here, spiritually speaking, it's describing the fact that sin, that, that sin reigns through death. The wages of sin is death. Um, when the enemy coerced Adam and Eve into going his way instead of God's way, so disobedience instead of obedience, many of us already know, so for those that are just joining us and maybe aren't familiar with it, but it's always good to, to be reminded that this caused a cataclysmic change in, in the human nature. Previously, Adam and Eve were born, or not born, I'm sorry, created without sin. And, uh, and then whenever they disobeyed, sin was brought into their, into their humanity. It became part of, and I, maybe the word is not proper to say DNA, but it gives us an understanding illustratively. Sin became part of their DNA. It became part of their interior of who they were. They're, in a sense, a spiritual genetic makeup. There's not really a better way to say it. And, and that, that gene, if you will, that sinful gene, the sinful nature, like Paul calls it, was spread throughout the entirety of the human race. For all human beings have come forth from Adam and Eve. Any teaching that says that it doesn't is a lie um, because all of mankind has been born into sin. Adam was was created without sin. He was, he was taken from the sinless clay of the earth and, and, and the life-giving breath of God was blown into him and he became a living soul and Adam walked upon the face of the earth without sin for some period of time. But that's not the case for the rest of us as human beings. And so whenever we're born the first time of Adam, we're born into a kingdom. We're born into a kingdom that is filled with sin. And the result of sin, again, the wages of sin, Romans 6 and 23, is death. Good news, good news. In the New Testament, we're taught that Jesus, he paid the death wage for us. He died on the cross. And when we put our faith in that, so he died on the cross for all of humanity and we're all his creation but we're not all his sons according to John chapter 1 he gives the power to become the sons of God in those that believe so you got to believe in Jesus Christ in order to become a son of God and when you do believe in Jesus Christ and what he did for you at the cross a, a miracle happens spiritually the, and we're going to get into that this morning the old man died the old man that was born of Adam with that genetic makeup dies he's buried a new man is resurrected to newness of life. In this process, uh, what ha something spiritual happens. There's a translation that takes place according to the book of Colossians where you're translated from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of his dear son. I can't tell you what else to say other than it's something that you have to believe when you read the word of God. And when the light bulb comes on, you know, Torrance Nash at the... At the uh, family camp meet and preached a beautiful message and it keeps ringing in my ears and what I got out of it was a grace event. He said, Paul said, because I am what I am because of the grace of God. When you've had a download of grace that, that changes your life and you know that your life has never been the same again, that, what, that's what I want you to understand is allowed to, to happen whenever there's a true translation, whenever we're truly born again it's like a grace event that changes everything. And it moves us from that kingdom where sin is reigning through death, and it moves us into a new kingdom where grace begins to reign. So the two kingdoms now are represented, the previous one, at, by a, a kingdom of sin and the results in death, and the new one is like a kingdom of grace through righteousness. That, that, that reigns in life. And we used two different kings in Israel's history to describe that. We used Ahab as a kingdom of sin and that resulted in bondage and oppression for the people. And then we used King Josiah and his kingdom of righteousness. It was a very momentary time, 
in Israel's history in 2 Kings 22 and 23. It'd be a beautiful thing to go back and read when we see the purge that King Josiah uh, began to enact in the land to get rid of the previous sin and the bondage and the oppression that had been brought about by all these previous kings. And it all started with the opening and the reading of the Word of God. And so I just want to encourage you to remember how important the Word of God is. But that was last week. Two kings, two kingdoms, but really focused on the idea, spiritually speaking, that when we got saved, and, and to understand it, though, if we don't understand it, we're not going to be able to navigate or walk this Christian journey within the kingdom of righteousness and where grace and, and reigns and into life if we don't even know about it. That's why, that's why it's so important to know the Word of God as believers. Um, can't live without it. You know, I'm not gonna, I, I, I gotta be careful I don't go off on too many rabbit trails, but let's just stay focused here. So, so that's where we were in 519. Now, let's go ahead and go to Romans chapter 6. Uh, and really, I titled this morning's message, um, Did You Not Know? or uh, something to that effect. Did you not know? Were you not aware? That's the idea of about what we're talking about this morning, okay? So Romans chapter 6, verses 1 through 3. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? And then here's where we're kind of transitioning and our focal point is. Know ye not that so many of us, as were baptized into Jesus Christ, were baptized into his death. And so really, I wanted to kind of focus on these, these three things right here. Know ye not. That's, what, that's really going to be point number one. I want to cover the concept of baptized with you, what that word means in the Greek. And then this concept right here having to do this is really the pivot point of what we're trying to talk about, is what we were baptized into, which was his death. So know ye not the concept of baptism, what that means, and into his death. All right. So, um, whenever the first, the first thing that I want to talk to you about is the idea of Know ye not. Okay, that word right there in the Greek language is called, is the word in the Greek is agnaeo. All right, so the way that that word would be spelled is, and it's not important to really know the word or, or how to spell the word, but I just, it's for the, for the relationship of trying to understand of what we're really trying to talk about here. This particular word has a two part meaning. The first part that's important for us to understand is ignorance and you know sometimes whenever we hear the word ignorant and especially if someone's speaking it to us it can be offensive but really the word because we don't like to be told that we don't know something but the word ignorant in and of itself is not a bad word it just means that we were unaware we were uneducated we didn't know that piece of information if you're trying to have a conversation with someone and you allude to the fact that they might not know something. If they're just going to get offended over that, you know, depending on the way that you're speaking it, if you're speaking it in love, well, then they're the ones that have the problem, okay? Because we don't all know everything. As a matter of fact, we all need to have a teachable spirit to be willing to learn, uh, especially when it comes to the Word of God. So the idea here is, know ye not, were you ignorant? But there's also a second part to it, and that word is dis inclination or disinclined okay well disinclined what is what does that mean you could be dis disinclined means I don't want to that's just the simple version of trying to to describe what that word means I don't want to I'm going to put an exclamation point there you know now because now the word disinclined can be I don't want to for a couple of different reasons Number one, it could be, I wasn't taught that way, okay? I mean, I've ran into that with a lot of people in the past. They were taught the Bible a specific way. 
whenever you start to break down certain things in the God, they don't want to buy it because it sounds, you know why? Because it sounds completely different than what they were taught. But the question is, is what is, this is my question, is what we were taught previously the right way or were we being taught the traditions of men? We're going to have to go to the Word of God and find that out for ourselves. We're going to also have to take a look in the mirror, the spiritual mirror, and we're going to have to question whether or not the way that we've been living our life in the past has lined up with what the Word of God would want for us, whether or not we've been failing in that those areas of our life, whether the fruit of the Spirit is being produced in our life, or whether the lusts of the flesh have been produced in our life. I can tell you that if on a repetitive basis, the lust of the flesh instead of the fruit of the Spirit is being produced in our life, we either, number one, are ignorant to the truth of the gospel, okay, because the Word of God says Jesus died to set us free so that we could walk in liberty and produce the fruit of the Holy Spirit, or number two, because I wasn't taught that way, I still don't want to go that way, or, or you know, I'm disinclined, or number, the second part of disinclined is, well, really, I guess that should have been A up here. I don't want to. And B right here, uh, I wasn't taught that way. And so, again, the other one is I don't want to. Even though you're going to tell me the truth, I don't want to go that way. So as far as, um, you know, as, as, as far as going into what I was going to say re regarding this uh, next concept on ignorance versus disinclination. I just wanted to, to really uh, use two different stories out of the Bible again real quick to describe the two. All right. Di ignorance versus disinclination. So the first one is uh, comes out of Joshua chapter nine and it's a, and I'm calling it a covenant of ignorance, a covenant of ignorance. It, it's a story about Joshua going through the land. They're about to enter the promised land, and they're conquering on the other side of the Jordan. They've won battles, uh, you know, in Jericho. In the end, they end up overcoming Ai. They've defeated uh, Og of Bashan, which was a, we talked about that a while back, that Nephilim king. Uh, various, they're, they're having victories, and the, and the word is spreading throughout the land that the children of Israel have been set free from Egypt and they're going through the land and they're conquering. The Gibeonites were near that area. They were actually close by, but what they did was they deceived Israel. Now, this illustration doesn't work perfectly for what I'm trying to describe in the Romans text, but again, just remember, a covenant of ignorance. So the Gibeonites, they prepare themselves. They get some old worn out sandals. They get some molded bread. They get some wine skins and they kind of like patch them up and make them look all worn down. And then they show, they present themselves to the leaders of Israel on the battlefields and they say, listen, we've come and traveled from a far land. And uh, we, we've we heard what you've been doing to the enemy. You're, you're very victorious. We want to engage in a covenant with you. We're, we'll be your servants and we're asking you to protect us. Now, Covenant with God is a very, very serious thing. If you give a vow if, in the Old Testament, if you gave a vow, if you gave your word, if you entered into covenant with someone, it was a very serious thing. God was not okay with people breaking covenant. And Israel, in ignorance, thinking that the Gibeonites were telling the truth and that they had come from a faraway land, they entered into covenant with the Gibeonites, and then later they realized that they had been deceived or that they were ignorant of what the Gibeonites were actually doing within the whole situation. Now, what I want you to, the main point that I'm trying to get you and I to understand is having to do with that ignorance part. That there's a level of misunderstanding, there's a level of unknowing or ignorance when we come into relationship with Jesus Christ. When we first get born again, we don't need to have to know a lot of information. I mean, if we're just assimilating or because we're going to church and sitting next to someone and they talk Christian lingo, and the next thing you know, we're talking Christian lingo, but we've never had a true event where we repented. Repentance means to change the mind, to turn about. Repentance means that we, we would have had to have heard the gospel message that said we were born sinners 
you know, we would have had to understand that to some extent that we weren't right. God's not playing with sin. God hates sin. God sent, God bankrupted heaven of its most prized possession and sent us Jesus to die on the cross to, to, for the whole purpose to pay the penalty of our sin. If we don't like to hear that, then we don't like to hear the gospel. And so at some point in time, we would have had to have at least understood and been convicted by the Holy Spirit that we weren't right. We might not have understood everything about being born in Adam, about being in this evil kingdom, and about our sinful nature. We didn't know any of that, really. But we knew that we needed Jesus. And we invited him in, and we asked forgiveness of our sin. Amen. And so that was the entry into covenant. It, it, uh, but, but, but at that time, we're still ignorant about what we're trying to teach this morning. And we're going to get into that in a moment. What, that's, I just want to leave that in. What am I ignorant of, preacher? Or what could I be ignorant of? Now, many people that come to our church, they've already heard this many a times. But we got new people all the time coming. And, and I just want you to know that many times there's a place in our walk that we're ignorant of a very critical, pivotal point when it comes to victory in Christ. Let me just say that again. Many times we're unaware of a very critical, pivotal point when it comes to walking in victory in Jesus Christ. And that is the essence of what we're talking about this morning. What is it that I need to know regarding victory? And this is going to be the first level, but we're going to go through many more as the weeks come up. All right. That was story number one, ignorance, under agna eo, the word know you not, okay? Story number two, Naaman. I use Naaman the leper a lot. It comes out of the book of King, uh, 2 Kings, I believe it is, chapter 5. Um, Naaman was a general, depending on what translation you read, of Aram or Syria. He was a leper, though. He was a very powerful leader in the military for the king of Aram. He won multiple victories. You know, it's a beautiful story if you go back and read it, but in one of the battle skirmishes, a young Israeli girl was taken captive and she actually became a servant in the home of Naaman. She begins to, to prophesy. She begins to preach the good news, if you will. She's like a little witness. And she talks about the prophet Elisha back home. And she says, boy, I wish my master, talking about Naaman, could see the prophet. He would be cured and healed of his leprosy. Now, in the Old Covenant, leprosy was a type of sin and what it does to the human person. It eats him up. And, you know, leprosy is visible on the outside and it can be shown. Uh, you know, it just this sin sooner or later takes its toll and it will start to show up on the outside. Uh, Naaman... Finally, when he hears the story, I mean, he gets a little bit of hope. And he heads on over to Israel. And when Elisha, the prophet, hears about it, he sends some servants out there and he tells Naaman's servants. He says, listen, just tell Naaman, this is real simple. Just go into the Jordan River and dip seven times in the Jordan River. Uh, and he'll, will, he'll be cleansed. Well, when Naaman hears this, he becomes angry. He thought that there was going to be some special ritual that was going to take place that was going to allow him to be cleansed of his leprosy. He became angry, really. He said, aren't there better uh, rivers in Damascus and Farpar, like where he was from in the area of Syria and the Arameans? There's better rivers over there, cleaner rivers than the Jordan River. If he wants me to just go dip in some silly river, I could have done that back home. Do you mean to tell me I traveled all this way to go dip in this dirty Jordan River. Listen, that's disinclination, my friend. That's like, in my mind, I don't want to do that. I got mindsets. I have frustrate. I don't even want to hear that. That is ridiculous. Listen, that's flesh. You got to understand, your flesh will stand in between you and receiving the blessing and the miracle that God has for you. Your flesh will get in the way. Your mind will be frustrated. Your heart will become hardened. You will become bitter if you allow yourself to be driven by your flesh. You will think in your mind that, that you have rights when in reality the rights that you're looking for are completely contrary to the will and the ways of God. God's will for Naaman's life was that he would be cleansed and that 
God would get the glory for it. We don't have time to go through the whole story, but that's exactly what happened. His servants began to talk to him and began to explain to him, Master, if he would have told you to do something else, that would have been, you would have done it. Why not just go ahead and do it? So you know what he did? He didn't even want to. <laughs> so many times our flesh, we don't even want to. But if we're willing to just take a step of obedience in the right direction, we can set ourselves up for a grace event where the Lord will show up and change everything. And what he does is, is he ends up going to the Jordan and he dips seven times. And on the seventh time, he comes out of the water and his skin is like the skin of a new child. Now, that's a beautiful testimony. That's a beautiful type of the new covenant. That's a beautiful illustration that shows us that, you look, look, even when we're disinclined, you know, if we would just give the Lord a little bit, if we'll just give it a little bit, turn a little bit towards his direction, we can set ourselves up for much better understanding. Now, i got to tell you that whenever uh, he ended up going back to uh, his hometown, his whole life was changed, and, and he worshiped the Lord. Well, according to what the Word of God says, his plans, anyway, were to worship the Lord for the rest of his life. Now, going back to our Romans text, know ye not. That was the main thing that I wanted to get across to you. Don't, you shouldn't be ignorant anymore. You should understand, and we're about to get into what we, what we might have been ignorant for, but, but that's the first step. We don't want to be ignorant of the truths of how to walk in victory. The truths of what it means when we got saved. I used to talk about, oh, I'm born again and didn't even know what I was talking about. Okay, so we don't want to be ignorant of that anymore. And we also don't want to be disinclined. We don't want to be disinclined and because of our own mindsets, frustrated about, well, this is a, some new doctrine. I don't like the way this guy is presenting it. Well, find you another preacher. I don't mean, I'm not trying to be ugly. I want you to enjoy the teaching. But, I mean, if you need to find another preacher, that's fine. But just make sure he's telling the truth. You know, I don't like the way that preacher does it. I don't like, you know, the, he just thinks he's so confident. I'm confident in the word of the Lord. I'm confident in what this word has done in my own life. I'm confident in the fact that previously as a Christian, I was ignorant because people weren't teaching me this. Because I realize now that the teachers that I sat under, and it's no slight on them, they didn't know it in order to be able to teach it. And that this was a complete game changer in my life. I had a grace event through understanding and through revelation of the word of God that began to help me to grow. So we're, no longer, we're not going to be ignorant anymore because we're being taught. And, 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 and we're going to know better how to direct and focus our faith. What we're supposed to put the focus of our faith on daily in order to walk in victory. And we're not going to be disinclined. I hope not. We don't want to be disinclined. We don't. Listen, what we want is the truth. And we want to have a teachable spirit. And we want to have a willingness to go God's way. We want to have a willingness for the truth. Whatever the truth is, I mean, do we pretend in our minds that we know truth? Do we pretend in our minds that we already know based upon what we've already done? Or is it possible that in some way, shape, or form, we could have been blinded spiritually to some truths in the Bible, and the teachers that went before us could have been blinded also, and the teachers before them could have been blinded also. We should, we should understand that that is very, very possible. Because the Word of God tells us through what Paul told Timothy, that in the last days, that there would be doctrines of devils, that people would fall away from the faith. This has been going on since the church started. This was going on in the Old Testament. It's still going on today. All right. So that was number one. Agna Eo. What does it mean? Ignorance, disinclination. Number two, baptized. That word baptized in the, in the Greek language, uh, this definitely needs to have a little bit of clarity. So the word, the word baptism that we use actually comes from a Greek word, baptizo. Now, I'm not trying, I promise you, I'm not going to get overly technical, but I will say this. This word is not considered a translation. It's not important that you remember all this, but for points of clarity, I, I like, I'm an information geek. 
I know that some people in our church are also. So, you know, it, there's a difference between a translation a tr and a transliteration. A translation gives you a definition. Okay? It gives you meaning. Transliteration, what it does is it takes one word in a language and it does letter for letter and it gives you a corresponding word into the new language. So if this is the Greek word right here, baptizo, then what they did was they took the beta, they took the alpha, they took the, the, uh, the, the, the pi, or the, actually, it would be spelled, we're spelling it in English, but it would, the pi it looks like that. That would be the P if we were writing it in Greek. They took the pi, they made a P, the tau, okay, the ypsilon, the sigma, well, they didn't do the sigma, uh, well, and, and they, it, you see what they did. So there's a couple of letters that are different. But so basically, it's a transliteration. It's not telling you the definition. So the problem that we have in English is when we hear the word baptism, yes, Pentecostal people understand baptism in the Holy Ghost, which is different, you know, than baptized into Christ, which is different than baptized into water. This right here is talking about being baptized into Christ. Okay, but let's just not even get into that right now. We don't have time to break it down that deep. There's three types of baptisms in the Bible, but we're not going to go through it just for sake of time, but for clarification purposes. There's a baptism into Christ, and the baptism into Christ is when you believe. The first day you believed, the Holy Spirit is the person that baptized you, and he baptized you from the world that you were born into through Adam, he baptized you into Jesus. Okay, that's what we're talking about in the Romans text. The second baptism is, either way, it could be water baptism, which is an outward sign of what happened inwardly. A spiritual change took place, all right? The water baptism, the preacher, John the Baptist, some other person, takes the believer, baptizes them into water, where, the, where this baptismal type is illustrates what happens spiritually. Third one, baptism into the Holy Spirit. Jesus is the baptizer. He baptizes the believer into the Holy Spirit. We believe in the initial physical evidence of speaking in other tongues, but it's a whole different baptism. But the main thing that I'm trying to get across to you this morning about baptism is that the meaning of baptism in the Greek language, did not mean water. Let me, let me say that again. The meaning of the word baptizo in the Greek language did not mean water. And in some of the contexts of the New Testament, yes, the translated word baptism is describing water baptism. And the way that we know that is because, like for instance, Philip with the eunuch, Candace's eunuch, he said, what? Well, What's going to prevent me from being baptized? Philip said nothing. You can be baptized right here. And there's other places in the New Testament where it's talking specifically about water baptism. But in this Romans 6 text, there's nothing in this text that describes water. Okay, this is talking about baptism into Christ. That when you put your faith in Jesus, the Holy Spirit took you and put you in Christ. And that's really what the word baptism means, baptizo means in the Greek language. If I would write it like this, taken from one place and put into another place. Taken from one place and put into another place. And, and the last thing I want to say about baptizo, or I say this is the last thing, one other thing I want to make a point about, is that in this process, the nature's changed. There's a nature change. Now, I'm just shooting from the hip, remembering some things that I've studied in the past. But in ancient Greek literature, not biblical literature, you know, ancient Greek language was in existence before before the New Testament was written. There was one in the Odyssey 
it used it used the word baptizo. It said he he had heated up his blade and he baptized or baptized it into the water. Now the idea, yeah, there's water there, but the real idea is is that he tempered the blade. The nature of the blade was changed. The whole purpose in doing that was to strengthen the steel. It changed the the strength the tensile strength of the steel at that moment when it was baptized or placed into that water. And there's other Greek examples that describe a changing of nature. And yes, the idea of immersion is involved in that. But the water act of water baptism is not what changes the nature to begin with. This spiritual miracle that happens. So I need, I need you to understand that. That is to be taken from one place, put into another place, and that through that process, the nature is changed. And so here we are, back over here. Know ye not, were you ignorant that so many of us, as were baptized or baptized into Jesus Christ, well, what were we, what were we baptized into? What, what is it that, that the Apostle Paul is wanting us to, to see here? And, um, and what is it that he's wanting us, wanting us to know? Okay, well, he wants us to, what we need to know is that we were baptized into his death. All right? So let's, let's go back and look at this. This is, this is the next part that I wanted you to see. What were we baptized into? We were baptized into his death. There was a position change that took place. Again, originally born in Adam born in this evil, sinful kingdom where sin reigned unto death. And then God prepared the world to receive Jesus. And when he did and the good news was preached and you put your faith in Jesus Christ, when you put your faith in Jesus Christ, at that moment, spiritually, you were baptized, baptized, you were placed into Christ Jesus. Where in the mind of God, you were placed into his death. It's so important that we understand this concept right here. I need you to know that God sees every believer who truly gets saved. You know, the book of Romans chapter 10 says that the way that we get saved is that we believe with our heart and we confess with our mouth. It, it doesn't say we believe with our head and confess with our mouth. Yes, you cannot believe with your heart without knowing something in your head, but you can have head knowledge, and you can say, yes, in my head I believe in Jesus, but not have heart change, where you say, where you, when I say heart, we're talking about the inner man. We're talking about the inner man giving his life to God, just like Jesus gave his life for us. He did the Father's will. He did not do his own will. Father, take if it be possible, take this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. He didn't do his own will. No, he gave his will over to the Father. And whenever we put our faith in Christ, at that moment, what the Bible is teaching is that a supernatural, spiritual miracle took place. And the Holy Spirit baptized baptized, baptized us, translated us, moved us from one place into a new place. And that new place was called in Christ. I want you to see that. In Christ. You were placed into Christ. And when you were placed in him, you were placed into his death. Now, I want to just say this. Many times when people study the Bible, they understand the concept of substitution. And what are you talking about? If the wages of sin is death, Romans 6.23, that means that somebody had to die. Jesus is the one that died. That concept theologically is called substitution. Jesus as a substitute for our sin, died in our place. Most people don't really have a problem with that. You know? I mean, they're like, yeah, I, I get that. 
Jesus was the substitute sacrifice for me. The problem that we have is identification. Identification. What does that mean? We have a hard time understanding and identifying ourselves as being one with Jesus and the reality that the old man that we were first born of Adam into the sinful world died. I need you to know that this morning. That's what I'm closing with. That was what my whole message was about. So that you would so that we no longer would be unaware or unlearned in this particular biblical truth. So that moving forward, we would understand that we died in Christ. And that's what the Word of God says. And as we move forward, I'll give it to you right now in Romans 6, 11, The Word of God says, So reckon yourselves therefore to be dead. Another translation says, So consider yourself therefore to be dead. God sees it this way. God's Word explains it this way. So since God sees you as dead in Christ, then guess what? The Lord wants you and I to also see ourselves as dead in Christ. Now, what does that exactly mean? It means that it changed the relationship between the believer and sin. See, sin has power behind it. And before Christ, sin is able to exert its power and influence at, at its own will in that person's life. Now, listen, I'm not trying to say that believers don't, they still have a sinful nature, but the relationship is changed. It's changed at the moment of conversion. But if a person doesn't know it, if they're ignorant to it, if they're in a covenant of ignorance, then they do not know to believe it. They do not understand to identify their self with this new covenant. And so therefore they continue to walk aimlessly, entered into a covenant that they're unaware of. And they continue to struggle spiritually because the enemy through sin, the power of sin is still allowed to, to hold sway in their life. But once a believer begins to understand this biblical truth, this is the beginning of it. This is the, the death side of the cross. Now there's a life and resurrection side of the cross. But until you get the death side of it first, to understand that the old man that you were born, he doesn't exist anymore in the eyes of God. And God wants you and I to understand that this morning. Amen. Listen, I'm closing with that. I'm going to go ahead and say a quick prayer. And I'll just, again, pray that the Lord will continue to bring healing into all of our lives. Father, we thank you for spiritual healing. I pray, Lord, for every single person that will watch this video. Lord, that you would allow your Holy Spirit to open up eyes. Lord, that you would cause uh, spiritual healing cataracts or scales to fall from the eyes, Lord, that you would allow us to be able to see your word, oh Lord God, that you would strengthen us and encourage us in our walk with you. We're asking you, Holy Spirit, to do the work on the inside of us. I'm praying for a physical healing for everyone that is being touched by this infirmity, Lord, that you'd cause them to be strong, that you'd cause them to stand up, oh Lord God, that you bring healing to their bodies, Lord. We're putting our hope and our trust in you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.